The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Dash Technology Group, ABN 93603 824 835, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Welcome to Your Next Client Is You, an ensemble podcast series dedicated to revolutionising financial advice practices with technology. Each episode, we're peeling back the layers of tech implementation, guided by the real-life experiences of a diverse group of advice practitioners. Whether you're tech-savvy or just beginning, they've been where you are, researching, choosing, and triumphing in the tech maze. So, are you ready for insights and inspiration to revamp your practice? Then let's dive in. Are you looking to introduce unprecedented efficiency in your practice? Dash solves the entire spectrum of advice delivery, allowing you to streamline your practice in ways you haven't been able to before. Automate your execution from customized websites to CRMs, modeling, and SOA generation, executed straight into the Dash investment platform. We offer an array of in-house apps and collaborate with third-party vendors to bring you the best solutions. Curious about what your peers have accomplished in their practices with Dash and our integration partners? Have a listen to some practice insights that are sure to get you thinking. Hello and welcome to this very special Ensemble podcast mini-series where we're going to apply the five-stage advice process we all know so well to the task of choosing and then implementing a new piece of technology into our practices. Now, we're gaining these insights through the experience of advice practitioners from within the Ensemble network, along with some insights from experts within DASH. I'm Peter Diamantidis, and the guests joining me here today are Andrew Grinsall from Cooey Wealth Partners, Courtney Walker from Fox and Hare, Jamie Arden from Kofkin Bond & Co., and Nigel Baker from Arch Capital and Sentium. Welcome, folks, and thank you for joining us. Great to be here. Thanks, Peter. Peter. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Peter. <laughs> it's a big crowd here today, so this is going to be a whole <laughs> lot of fun. <laughs> now... This is episode one of this tech series, and we're going to kick things off, like I said, by focusing on the fact-find stage and really the importance of taking the time to consider the specifics of your business before diving into that research phase, you know, looking at all the different technology partners. Now, we've actually intentionally selected guests from quite a wide range of sort of practiced approaches and the clients they look after, all those sort of things are quite different. So I'd love to just start with diving into getting to know each of your businesses better, starting with some basics. You know, I'd love to know what stage the practice is at. You know, is it sort of startup growth or consolidation? And how many staff do you have in each of these different, you know, in each of the different roles within the practice? Courtney, let's start with you at Fox and Hare. Yeah, awesome. So we actually just celebrated our sixth birthday at Fox and Hare. Um, We've had a lot of growth. Over the last six years, all organic growth, which is really exciting. And we're sort of in a state where we're consolidating all of our processes ready for that next sort of five years of, of more growth. Yeah. Um, so we've got a, a team of 15. We've got three advisors, three associates all doing their, their professional year. And we've got a team of six in Cebu in the Philippines, which is sort of an outsourcing arrangement, but for all intents and purposes, they're sort of part of the team. Fantastic. So you actually have a high proportion of the sort of PY year as, as you know, as a percent of your team. That's probably quite high compared to most practices. Yeah. You either have zip or quite a low percent. Yeah. And I guess that's representative of our growth. So we sort of feel that over the coming years, we can facilitate their move into that advisor role, given the growth that we're having in the business, which is really exciting. Super exciting. So, Andrew, let's talk about Kui Wealth Partners. You know, what sort of stage are you guys at and, and how big is the business at this point? Yeah, so we've been around for uh, since 2017, so um, about six years as well. Um, sort of formed out of a prior business that had been around a lot longer than that. But uh, we're at a stage now where we've got 15 staff across the um, the Kui Wealth Partners side of the business. But when we look out to the, the broader Kui group, uh, where we've you know, built our mortgages business, our accounting business, property business, uh, we actually increased to about 30 staff, uh, and ten, that includes 10 who are uh, offshore uh, in 
various admin support, power planning, um, and and other um, you know, client service type roles. So all up, it's sort of in the 30s, isn't it, the total yeah, staff? 30 sort of, to 32, um, somewhere around that sort of number. And you guys are, I mean, when I first looked at the profiles of the business, I would have said you're in consolidation, but I get the sense it's sort of more growth for you guys still. You're still sort of on an upward trajectory. Is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're probably taking on about uh, anywhere between two and four new clients a week at the moment. So we're certainly still growing uh, the business uh, and we don't have any plans to slow that down anytime soon. <laughs> Woohoo! Game on. Fantastic. Um, Jamie, let's talk about you guys. So what sort of stage are you at in the business and, you know, to talk about the team and the size of the business? Yeah, pretty similar to what Courtney said, actually. So we've got 11 in the financial planning side of the business, um, one in our sort of mortgage broking and three in the consulting arm. Um, so right now, I, I guess we're sort of consolidating our processes and um, sort of gearing up for the next stage of the business um, with adding additional services on. So um, right now, we've we've sort of had three come through a professional year um, with, with another sort of two starting at the moment. Um, I think they're around six months through. So bringing through that next wave of advisors, which is always exciting, um, and gearing ourselves up for that next stage. So that's fantastic. So that's sort of getting your ducks in a row and almost tapping into a bit of scale before you, you grow further. Is that correct, fair? Correct. Yeah. That, that, that's spot on and, and, and you know, really enhancing those processes to make our lives easier as we move into that next stage of the business. Oh, I think we're all on that game, aren't we? Making yeah. our lives easier. You're very welcome. Nigel, how about you? Yours, I've got a bit of a different story in terms of the business, but I'd love to take a look at the broader sense, you know, broader than Centium, uh, the business, what stage is that and, and you know, um, the size of the practice generally. Yeah, Peter, um, look, obviously we're wearing two hats. Um, the Arch private practice has been going since 2012. Uh, we've got three advisors, one starting next week, so that'll be four, two associate advisors, a uh, practice manager, superstar that does everything, and then some outsourced sort of power planning, that sort of stuff. So, um what does that take us to 10? Um, and then the CNTM side is is the startup or the, I don't know how to define startup to next stage, but um, we're in that phase of been going a few years, now got some business on track and we're sort of validated that. So that's that's mainly a, a contracted business. So it, it's on and off depending on what we need. So we've got some big tech teams. So there could be, you know, 20 people working on it for a week and then they, they disappear. So um, so that's really a couple of key people who are employed and the rest are all all uh, all, all contracted as and when we as and when we need them. Yeah, okay, and it's and just for the listener, then it's fair to say that um, you know, you're here on on quite a extreme version of the tech journey because it might have started um from the practice and the insights you were getting for that, but you've now gone to the extent of actually a, a solution that white labels for other advisors. So you've really gone deep. Like the project took you further down the original path, perhaps you intended. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's sort of like, let's build it ourselves. Why would you hopefully walk, go and do that? I don't know. But uh, anyway, we're here. And um, yeah, so we built it out. And um, I sort of can talk a bit more about that later. Yeah. Yeah. You're a brave man, Nigel. <laughs> I've, still, I've still got hair. Only just. <laughs> we might check in. It's six to 12. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm with Courtney there. It's, it's, a, it's a big task, but exciting, really exciting. All right. So that's a sort of practices themselves, I'm, I'm keen to sort of understand the other factors that play into the decisions when it comes to tech. And one of the key things is clients, right? Our ideal clients or our niche, whether it's the current clients you serve or who you intend to serve. Um, then I'm curious for each of you, you know, who that is and then any preferences they have that sort of can influence your tech decisions. Let's start with you, Andrew. How about for you guys? What what are the, the factors that play for you in that area? So, uh Clients are uh, typically high-income earning professionals. We definitely work more in the uh, the wealth accumulation space um, than some other practices might uh, act. So, um, what sort of happened though over time is uh, naturally we've um, we have moved a bit more into that pre-retiree and retiree space as clients have inevitably got older, and then also you get referrals from existing clients. They refer their parents for advice. Uh, and also a few clients that have come with me from previous firms as well. But uh, certainly our focus has been around uh, how we can service that high income earning, um, wealth accumulating professional. Uh, and um, that does change the way that you want to interact with clients as well. Um, they they have different preferences and different times around when they can meet with you. Mm -hmm. um, so it does um, it does result in some differences there. And you had an interesting journey that COVID naturally took you on. Where I, I understand you're now basically a fully virtual business. Is that yeah, is that absolutely. true? 
Yes, one hundred percent of our client interactions are through Microsoft Teams. Now uh, we no longer have a physical office and presence. What actually happened there is, um, as everybody did, we sort of went back to working from home during the COVID lockdowns. And um, once the lockdowns opened up, we went back into the office and uh, we spent the first few months maybe with like one client a fortnight actually wanting to come into the city for a meeting yeah. and all gotten used to Teams and we were getting good feedback because we were able to um, you know, do smaller meetings with clients more often uh, rather than, than trekking into the city, taking half a day off work. So you try and make the most of it and you just spend two hours in a meeting and it's just an information overload because we can break it down into smaller bits now for the clients and um, that certainly helps them. And it, you know, it might just be a quick catch up for half an hour and we, we move on and we, we tackle that, that matter that they used to be attended to. And particularly for even like, so for a couple, I know I've had... Yeah. Um, appointments with some, you know, experts where I'm dialing in from home. I work from home myself, hmm. but, you know, my husband's a tradie and so he can just go to a quiet spot and dial in from there and we can actually have a meeting with somebody that never would have happened otherwise because yeah. it's just so easy to dial in. Yeah, absolutely. Lunchtime meetings are always really popular. We find sort of between 12 and 2 uh, and then again between 6 and 8 p.m. are our most preferred times for our clients to interact with us and that's just something that probably wouldn't happen if we were still in that face-to-face office environment. Interesting. Meetings. Interesting. Mm-hmm. So, Courtney, you've got an interesting demographic for your practice. How is that sort of, who are they, you know, and how has that played into what they're looking for in terms of the experience or technology? Yeah. So, we only work with members sort of roughly 25 to 45. I think the average age of a Fox and Hair member is about 34. So, interestingly, we've got members as young as 21. We've got some that are approaching 50. Uh, but we don't do any retirement advice. And very similar to Andrew, we sort of went through the same stage through COVID where out the other end, we've we've gone completely virtual and and we all work remotely as well. Um, Interesting working with a younger demographic. We're sort of competing with your Netflix, your Ubers, you know, our, our members really want to be able to connect with us through their device. Um, they want a lot of value beyond the face-to-face meeting with their advisor. So they want constant accountability, um, constantly sort of in touch, convenient, quick, um, and in their pocket. Yeah. Awesome. So Nigel, for, for yourself then and Sentium, you know, I mean, your, your niche or your target now is different because it's not so much the, the end user as much as the firms, but I guess there is an end user focus. Can you talk us through that and what it's meant in terms of your, you know, what they're looking for and how they want to engage? Yeah, but the journey was, I mean, most of our clients were that typical sort of retired, pre-retiree type um, client base. And we, we had a view to be a family advisor, so to better offer a service to the whole family. And obviously that had its issues in terms of how do we provide that advice to the to the grandchildren or children. So that's how CNTM eventually came out of the out of the shell saying, well, let's build something that can provide a service to these other family members. And um, and so, yeah, so it's still from the art point of view, it's still very much those that retiree type client or, or business owner. We're not um, overly selective about that. We've always had an open door policy, which is a problem in itself, but that's why we created this sort of, or we felt we needed a solution for those clients that didn't quite need that full comprehensive service or we, we, we do uh, engage uh, and actively try and engage the, the whole family and, and provide a service there as well, which is which is where CNTM fits in. Yeah. yeah, so that's about the breadth of possible people you're dealing with and, and the need to be flexible in that sense, I guess, in terms of how they mm-hmm. want to engage, which mm-hmm. would have its own challenges. So, Jamie, talk us through your niche or your target clients. I'm interested because I know that yours are a little different here. Um, and I'm curious about yeah. whether they have a preference for in-office meetings and, and, and how that sort of factors in. Yeah, a, a real big. So I, I guess if, if I want to say a target client, we do a lot within the SME space. Um, mm-hmm. So so our founders always work with sort of business owners. And, and when you look at wealth creation, they're always an interesting client because a lot of the time these business owners are putting that money back into their business as a lot of people on this call would, would be the same. And and so, you know, it, it's a space where some people haven't dealt with before. And, and then, but, you know, I guess as they come to that sort of pre-retiree and then retiree, that's when they're selling their business and, and they want, you know, care after that as well. So we've sort of always played in that space, but I still look at them as you know every business owner's your mum and dad client at the end of the day. Um, you know they still got the same needs as, as when you're dealing with others. So, um, so similar to what Nigel said, open door policy. We want to deal with intergeneral, uh, intergenerational wealth transfer. You know, we want to deal with the kids. We want to get them involved in the estate planning side of the thing. So 
Um, that that's how we've sort of structured our business, and then from a corporate level, um, dealing with not for profits and, and endowment funds and things like that. So that's sort of where I talked around that consulting side of the business. So mm-hmm. um, that's also an area that they were involved in. Um, within that, I guess you've got a range. We're probably not as heavily reliant. Um, we we started online meetings um, pre COVID um, using Zoom, and, and because we had executives that. You know, we're struggling to get into the city, um, but we also have a, a large demographic that wants that face-to-face. Um, you know, a lot of times uh, some of these business owners don't want to be using apps and all that around their technology. So yep. our technology play has really been on the back end in creating efficiencies to make their life easier once, you know, they've got to fill out that sort of paperwork as we talk about. But, you know, they're, they're definitely we, – we've tried areas where we've, you know, had, had apps where they can get heavily involved and things like that and then so the uptake wasn't high. So we, we, our sort of structure that we've thought about is a little bit different. And it's an important realisation, isn't it? It's, it's just because others are going down that path and their niche at suits doesn't mean it is for you. And I can see for SMEs, you know, they may want to actually come into the office because they need to have time away from their business in that this is about them, not the business. And so being away from it helps. Yeah, and I think I think they've also got the ability to leave the office um, to come and and have that meeting as well. So yeah. when we're dealing with the executives, you're probably right. They they've probably got the time at work during lunch. Hey, can we just book in a teams meeting, husband, wife, or how's your sure. stroke of family unit looks? Um, but yeah, with an SME owner, sometimes they are willing to take out that morning to come in and, and go through a sort of whole breadth of things. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Now I'm also curious, Jamie, for you then, um, where you're at on the sort of outsourcing and and you know, offshoring journey because that's another thing that factors into all of this. Do you currently use any outsourcing or any out- offshoring resources? We we don't. We have in the past, um, and it's definitely I, I'm I'm always open to those possibilities and looking to it. But I think you know we've been on a journey of really growing our scalability within our team. Um, you know, when I talked about uh, bringing young advisors on, that's the process that we've gone over the last couple of years. So when we're talking about consolidation, we sort of got to an area with our technology, with our team, that that's something we'll explore now to help them sort of further right. provide scalability. But yeah, at the moment, all on shore, um, all in the office. Um, you know, we, we, we have staff that actually want to come in and, and really get actively involved together. Um, but we have some sort of flexibility in our work arrangements with them as well. So um, different staff sort of choose their own flexibility. Awesome. Awesome. And so, Nigel, how about you guys? How much, what's the balance there between your sort of extent to which you either outsource or offshore? Or offshore or what yeah. sort of elements of the business have you done that with? Well, the Santium um, side of it, obviously, a lot of offshore stuff. I mean, the, um, the tech partners are Australian businesses we, we work with, but they're their developers and engineers, are like, uh, a lot of them are, are offshore. Um, from the outside, yeah, we've got two. two uh, we outsource power planning to a business in Australia, but um, we've got some support staff that are offshore. So I've, it's been hit and miss over the years. I remember starting out a few years ago, and it was pretty pretty tough. And yeah. the quality was, you know, not it was just tough. To, but now I think the, there's a lot more businesses that help with that engagement, and that training. It's got a lot better. And, um, and you know, we've learned. Uh, along the way that they're really going to be part of the team and really feel like part of the team and it, it really works well. So while they're not here in the office, they're in every meeting and every little team meeting and every event and we include them in, in Christmas parties and things even though they can't be here, you know, those sort of things mm-hmm. where they, we feel like they're part of the team. We know who they are and they know who we are. And Yeah, fantastic. And Andrew, I'm, I'm imagining you guys use a fair few uh, different, of you know, different elements of the roles that are either sort of outsourced or offshore. Yeah, that's right. So we've got um, two offshore power planners, three offshore financial planning assistants. Then outside of the, the financial planning business, we've got um, a property assistant, a finance assistant, uh, and two accounting assistants in our accounting okay. business. Uh, so yeah, we do have a few, oh, and a marketing assistant as well. Um, <laughs> can't forget that one. Uh, so yeah, we do have uh, some offshore uh, hires there. Now they're, they're direct uh, employees of us. Um, yeah. um, we did go through the the, um, the offshoring businesses and the BPOs uh, in the past. Sort of worked out that wasn't right for us and um, yeah, changed our model around that uh, about 18 months ago. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's an interesting journey, isn't it? But it sounds like um, because of the stage you're at, you've probably done a lot of work on what the process and the tasks were before you then found the person. So it's it's. I think probably oh, Nigel Life probably had the same experience where I went too early. I didn't actually know exactly what I wanted them to do before I got them in. Whereas now that I do and it's really well enunciated, it's much easier to offshore. Is that fair for you? Yeah, absolutely. So we um, we have a queuing system that we use where we we allocate tasks to um, a, a queue that um, is handled by those different um, offshore teams and. 
we've basically gone through and identified all of the tasks and responsibilities and said, right, well, you know, what sits with your wealth partners or your financial advisors, what sits with um, your power planners, what sits with your, uh, your financial planning assistants. So whenever any of those items come up uh, that, you know, can be sent to the uh, the financial planning assistants, it's just a matter of clicking the submit to Q button and it goes off to them and it comes back complete generally pretty quickly. Perfect. How about you, Courtney? What's your? I mean, I'm. Uh, you mentioned actually in the intro, but you guys do use a few resources in that respect. What roles do they fill for the practice? Yeah, so we've got six in Cebu in the Philippines. We've got three power planners, uh, two in what we call member concierge, which is very much sort of the data management onboarding type role, and then one in member fulfillment, which again is a fancy fancy card of got implementation. So. That works really well for us. And, and we've got a, a student working in a member fulfillment capacity in Australia as well, part-time. And look, for the listener, the, the reason I'm sort of diving into these is these are all facets that paint a picture of how, you know, each of these practices have made choices on tech that might prove to be quite different. You know, and it's because it's not just the need they have, it's the resources they utilize or the resources they tend to in the future and, you know, where they're located, how they engage with them, all those things will play a part in the choices you make and the features you might look for um, because you're all interacting in a very different way. So, you know, keep that in mind for your own um, research and investigation when you embark on this this tech journey. Now, it would be remiss of me having a, a virtual room of uh, vice practitioners together not to ask about what you think about the future of the industry. So I've got to take that opportunity um, just to sort of hear, you know, what are you excited about for the future? you know, with the financial advice industry and therefore, you know, based on that, what opportunity you see exists for your particular business. Jamie, do you want to kick us off with that? Yeah, look, I think the industry has been through, uh, you know, uh, different times over the past few years and, and it sort of brought a lot of concern to, um, I, I guess, people that had established businesses, um, you know, that had been doing things a certain way. But, you know, for me, I think it's an exciting future. You know, we, we're considered a profession now. Um, young advisors are coming through, um, doing a university degree, doing another qualification and going through a professional year. So for me, I, I look as the reputation growing around this industry. Um, you know, we've reduced in advisor numbers, but you know, it, it is going to be something that's appealing to a younger generation moving forward to, to join our industry. So I think there's exciting times. Hopefully what we can see is um, policy being put around, um, you know, making it more efficient for the end user, um, the client, as we talk about, you know, making it clearer and making advice um, easier to deliver for them um, right. and making it more affordable. You know, I think all the information and all the, you know, statistics out there say that the advice has become un- you know, unaffordable for some and we don't want that. We want to provide financial literacy education. Um, we want to be able to do more than just be a- an advisor. So, and, you know, we're looking at multiple things about how we can sort of service not just only our clients but the broader community. So, you know, I think the industry is going through a much needed change. Um, you know, I haven't been in pit as long as others, but you know, I'm excited to see what sort of a, a younger generation of advisors can bring to the industry. Nigel, that sort of leads me to your answer that in terms of your take on the industry, because I'm imagining it's it's somewhat similar in terms of where you hope it's going to go and what it'll do. I'd love to hear your take. Yeah, I mean, um, look, I've been in the industry what. Well, Almost 20, over twenty years now, but there's a really bright future. If you're joining the industry today, it, it, it's a huge future. I think there's a long way to go still, though. I think, I think that we're we're becoming an advanced industry, not a product industry. Yeah. Uh, it does frustrate me a lot how there's still a lot of product focus from industry groups and professional associations, from it's awards and sales awards and all this sort of stuff that is the past and needs to go. Um, I'm also a chart of the counter. I know that's boring, but like, there's no talk about sales awards. There's no talk about product. I know we need product at the end of the day, but we've really got to all push hard for that because that's when we, you know the, the, the change in the industry needs to become around. And I think we're, we're close, being that professional about clients, about how do we help clients, how do we help more people. Um, yes, the, again, there's product at the end of the day, but we've got to have that mindset about how we help more people and how we solve these problems. Um, and as I said, we're, we've come a long way, but I still think there's a, there's a fair way to go to get that sort of that, that product emphasis out of the way. Um, and yeah. being sitting at a... Uh, accounting and independent space all these years, you sort of just kept away from it and just said, you know, I'm not going to those events. I'm just sick of being hounded. And I think we're getting there, but I think there's a long way to go still. Um, and yeah, the education qualifications, all those things, those things are great, uh, but we've still got some way to go. Um, um, but I think everyone's on that page now. What is these guys just left in the industry really have that in their mindset that we're here to 
hit our clients, we're going to um, create a great industry for the future and leave legal legacy behind us. And yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I think um, there's just going to be some pockets in the industry that, that tr- sort of trail behind. I was stunned to realize recently that one of those sort of ranking things that comes out, one of the questions it asks and it uses to rank advisors was FUM. Right. They were still asking for FUM, and I was yeah. stunned. I, I, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's, yeah. I, I got to explain. Yeah. It was my reaction. Yeah. You can't be serious. That's something you're measuring people on, but it truly was. Um, yeah. You know, and to go in light of that stuff. For. Right, and I mean, you and I both. I've got a similar, you know, twenty plus years uh, in the game, and and we remember the old days, but it's just not that anymore. So we've just got to get rid of that stuff. Uh, yeah, you know, it's it's not relevant. Andrew, I'm curious about your take and the sort of the future of the industry and what what that means. You're excited about for the practice. Yeah, so when we set up Kui Wealth Partners back in 2017, we were um, very much of the view that we wanted it to be um, very much strategy focused. Uh, we're totally fee for service, uh, even to uh, into the insurance side of the business where we do insurance with our commissions uh, fully rebated to clients. And um, yeah, so we set out with that strategy mindset, getting away from the product focus. And what we've seen over time is as the banks have mostly exited the advice space and advisors are now away from that. We're seeing more advisors focused in this strategy space. Now, we don't see that as any sort of threat to us. I actually think it's a great thing because it increases the um, the reputation of the industry. Mm-hmm. Um, certainly, uh, some of the events I've been to, like the Ensemble one, you get around uh, and you meet with other advisors and certainly the talk there is all about you know, clients and strategy and it's not product it barely comes up as a mm. conversation um so you know that's great um so there's certainly members of the advice community that are moving down the right path and i think that's encouraging uh, i think regulations need to catch up with that uh when you look at most of the regulations it's all about financial products advice yeah. uh not about um financial advice um, you know, for us, the, the product is just the means to execute the strategy and that's it. Uh, with us, with clients, we probably won't even talk about product until about the fourth meeting yeah. with them. Uh, so look, I think it's it's moving in the right direction, but uh, you know, as Nigel was just saying, I think there's still a long way to go uh, for um, the industry to get to where it needs to be, but on the right direction. How about you, Corny? What's your take on the sort of the- – you know, the future of financial advice and, you know, how that might play out for, you know, practices like Fox and Hare. What's what's going to make that an opportunity for businesses like yours? Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, first and foremost, I echo the message of Jamie, Nigel and, and Andrew. It has been a really tough time for the industry, um, but I just think the future is, is so bright and so exciting. Um, I think, first of all, the, the industry has been really rigid and structured in a way that that really caters to retirees and pre-retirees. Yeah, that's so about- sort of breaking down those barriers will make financial advice more accessible to younger Aussies and Aussies that perhaps have felt a bit left behind by the industry. Yeah, diversity is also growing, which is really exciting. You know, we're seeing more women enter the industry, non-binary people. And hopefully we'll start seeing more people from sort of diverse cultural backgrounds, which I think yes. just makes, you know, makes for more comprehensive advice and, and better outcomes as well. Yeah, um, it's certainly that connection piece needs diversity. It won't happen. No matter how early those of us that all look a bit similar try, it's going to happen when there's the, the, you know, the public are reflected in our industry. They can see themselves in the industry. It doesn't mean they have to go to an advisor that's exactly like them, but it makes a massive difference to how connected they feel they can be to that industry. Yeah, it's so important. Um, yeah. And then the last one is obviously the emphasis on sustainable and ethical investing is is really gaining momentum, which is super exciting. Yeah, and it would be for you guys. And in fact, I wanted to touch on for our next, you know, sort of question around, you know, the legacy of the practice. What do we know? What do we want to be known to stand for? Um, anything, and then anything that that sort of that impacts on technology. Let's let's continue, Courtney, because I know Fox and Hair has some specific things that it sort of um, has focused on and and worked on, and and B Corp is one of them. So I'm curious about, you know, that legacy and then how that might play into tech. Yeah, so uh, as you just said, we actually became a B Corp in July 2022, which is really exciting. Yeah. Um, 
and we just revised our mission and purpose as well. So the fox and hare purpose is to create a more equal world. Um, and I would say that although we've just sort of set it in stone, that's seen at the heart of everything that we have done and that we will do going forward. So, yeah. you know, we want to drive change, promote diversity. We want financial advice to be more accessible for all Aussies, regardless of their background, financial literacy, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and we hope to sort of create that opportunity for other businesses to follow in our footsteps, I guess. And do you see potentially um, technology playing a part in that? Because, you know, it, it can form part of accessibility, you know, being able to reach people that maybe wouldn't come into an office or anything like that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, most of our members, as I said earlier, are used to dealing with Netflix and Uber and <laughs> having everything at the click of a button. So when they then deal with us, they, they don't understand what's this 100-page statement of advice, why does it take so long, what, you know, um, what's the difficulty that we're facing here. So I think yeah. if we can make it more accessible and use technology to do so, it, it will just create much better outcomes. Jamie, so I'm curious on this for you too. So in terms of what you'd love the practice to be known for or the legacy and, you know, how that may have impacted uh, either the project that you work on for technology or technology choices generally, I'm, I, I'm imagining that, you know, streamlining things for your clients would be a big focus as well for the practice. Yeah, I think as I sort of stated at the start, yeah, streamlining the back end is a big part for us. And it's not just, it was what Courtney just said, like a client, you know, we can almost deliver the advice in the meeting. And it's one of those things where you can show them different examples of different strategies that we can take. You know, there's so many great tools out there that, that show different projections in regards to if, if we change certain strategies, what would look, that look like in the future for you? And, and having that conversation with clients and it it's almost like they see the advice, they see the strategy there live, and then you say, well, look, we can't be executed until we deliver all these things afterwards. So, you know, that's where I really want to enhance that experience for the client, and and that's not something that they're seeing. So, then when I talk about back-end efficiencies, it, it's so that they feel like they've, they've left that meeting, they, they, they feel engaged, and then it's executed in a timely manner. Um, so what I want the, the firm to be known for is developing every day. I think, you know, we, we are always looking for exciting new things to get involved in and, and we're continuously enhancing different sort of, um, you know, services that we're providing our clients. So, you know, our vision's changing over time, but as, as I sort of talked about earlier around that financial education within communities, we want to enhance community. Um, we want to enhance the work that we're doing and that's why we sort of add the consulting side of our business that's got nothing to do with financial advice and, and sort of lends it help, it lends its hand with, you know, helping around that education. Yeah, it really does. So Nigel, I'm uh, betting that this sort of legacy piece is part of part of what led you into CNT. I mean that you wanted to make a difference in a different way. You know, how did that play out? Um and what you know, what do you want the, you know, CNT legacy to be? Um, for the industry or the public? Yeah, but I think with our legacy for like, the arch business was just uh, how many people can we help um, relatively and we had a goal of wanting to help a thousand family groups and with that, what technology would we need to help those other people? But right. when you think about it, I was thinking, well, that's that's great. That that, that could make an impact on maybe a, a couple of hundred people or a thousand people. But wouldn't it be great to solve this bigger problem and, and have the bleeder legacy that we're able to crack this code that we could help thousands of people? So. You know, exciting. We work with a group now that's got over 20,000 clients and we're creating that platform to like 20,000 people that access to advice that they otherwise wouldn't be able to. Um, through, obviously through a technology platform that leads them to advice, but keeps them in a, in a education that sort of pre-advice format. Um, and that's, yeah, that's what we want to create. If we can, if we can build that and, and create that gap and create that solution that fills that gap and that allows more people to access the great knowledge that the people on this chat have got, the great advice out there that can only help a limited number of people. So, uh, we've got to, in our view, so how do we help get technology to get that information? That seems like knowledge in, in Latin. So how do we get the knowledge out there? And how can we, um, you know, when the industry was being battered around as well. And you you get to a point of a bit of ownership over that and go, well, let's change the narrative. Let's, rather than walking every conversation where, oh, you're a financial planner, imagine we could change this and say, hey, we added value to hundreds of thousands of people. We'd change that narrative. This industry actually went out there and took a step forward and worked out a way to help all these people at a very nice price point very economically rather than, oh, we can only help a certain number of people because that's what the law says. So there's a few motivations there, but I think yeah. you know, we're just trying to help more people and that's that's a simple goal and how do, how do we do that? And it's certainly an exciting one. I mean, I look at um, the progress of something like Canva and the impact they're having globally on small businesses and the number of members. 
Like it, it, that would, I reckon that'd become an addiction. Like every time that ticked over to the next hundred million people, we think mm. like, wow, you know, that'd just be be firing you forward to keep on going. Um, Andrew, I I don't know that you necessarily have world domination plans at uh, this stage. No, certainly not. <laughs> so, what sort of legacy are you seeing for the practice? And you know, what do you what do you want? to be known for? What do you want your clients to say about you? you know, is there any, yeah. And is there any particular way that relates to technology or even the experience for the client? Yeah, absolutely. So we are certainly focused on that strategy element of advice. So we really want to be known you know, for providing truly holistic advice that is in, independent, non-conflicted, not aligned, really covering all bases of what the clients need to get from where they are today to the achievement of their goals. Uh, that's something that I was deliberately looking for when um, I decided to join Kui because I'd worked in firms in the past where clients would come in and, you know, everybody wants an investment property and you'd say, well, we can't help you with that. And you'd be, you know, sort of pushed down a path of recommending managed funds or something like that. And what I found was that the clients would inevitably walk off and go and do it anyway, and they'd do it quite poorly. And I think it'd be great to be able to help people throughout all these major financial decisions. And property is one of the biggest financial decisions that people make. And to you know, exclude that from your advice offering, you know, to me, that was a, a concern. So really, we want to be known as a, a firm that you know, we'll, we'll cover the property if that's part of the client strategy. We'll cover investments, we'll cover super, whatever it is that the client needs, that's what we will look at to get them from where they are to where they want to be. Uh, now, with that, it does bring technological challenges because you end up with different teams that deal with different parts of, of things and they all have their own way about going about things. So trying to create a, you know, a, a CRM where all users can be part of that, um, you know, no matter which team they fit into and workflows and how everybody sort of cuts in and interacts with each other is sort of the challenge that it presents, but also yeah. there's you know, the opportunity that comes with it as well. Yeah, which is it's and it's exciting to be able to position your practice to sort of reap the benefits of what's going on in technology in a broader sense. You know, I mean, mm. we've managed to get some thirty plus minutes into this tech episode without mentioning AI, and I'm very proud of us all for doing that. But but it's um it is something that you know I'm excited for practices to be ready for the impact. You know, like to get yourself in a state such that taking advantage of something like that is is ticking a box or or just folding it in. So I'd imagine you guys are sort of wanting wanting to get yourself well positioned to be able to take advantage of those sort of um, value and, and you know, uh, even margin, you know, that it can deliver um, because it can just make things that much easier for your team. Yeah, we totally are. Yeah, yeah right. It's just part of, part of what we're all trying to do. Now, that's the big picture. You know, that's the thing that um, we all talk about when we're having a glass of wine at the end of a conference, um, you know, what our legacy and impact is. But I'm curious then to sort of talk then about the next layer down, which is those sort of you know, specific goals or even the projects for the business. So, you know, how you know, they could be longer term sort of goals you've got or even how it's translated into shorter term projects for the business and what you're focusing on. So Courtney, how about you? What are your sort of medium term goals and, and what are some more specific ones that have come up recently? Yeah, sure. So uh, longer term goals is very much to create a positive impact in the financial advice industry. We'd love to get to a stage where we're only recommending sustainable and ethical investments for our members, which is really exciting. And obviously, lots of growth. We want to support new advisors coming into the industry and we want to support younger Aussies to get accessible advice. Um, over the last sort of 12 months or so, we've gone through a stage of really restructuring our foundational processes. So they're really robust. And um, at the moment, we're working on sort of implementing um, this technology that we're going to be talking yeah. through over the next few episodes to, I guess, level up the foundations, take the focus away from the face-to-face -face time with the advisor and figure out how else we can interact with our members on an ongoing basis and, and help them achieve their goals. And it's an interesting point we probably should make just in case there are some listeners out there that don't know the Fox and Hem model. You've used the word members a number of times. So so you guys really do um, – that's not like they're coming to the gym, although I guess it's something similar. Um, but it is. You're, yeah. You're, yeah, right. You're running your sort of more high-touch um, ongoing membership rather than yeah. something that's sort of annual in its timeline. Is that valid? Exactly. Yes. Sorry. I did try and keep the language as clients, but you fall into, <laughs> into habits. Um, 
So, you know, member our members are used to dealing with memberships. I've mentioned Netflix. I've, you've just mentioned gym memberships. So we sort of um, market our fox and hair service offering as a membership package. So we just charge a flat fee every month. They can turn it off whenever they like, very similar to your Netflix and your, your gym. Yeah, which is an important consideration because that would also change some of your tech decisions because there is a more constant communication potentially for your for your service. Um, some of oh. us have more of a sort of annually and six monthly cycle, you know, so that factors in. Whereas for you guys, it sounds like it's, it is far more sort of uh, constant, the communications going on. And so you need to sort of factor that in um, to your tech choices. Exactly right. Jamie, how about you? What are some of the, the goals going forward for, for your business? You know, what are you looking to knock off and achieve? What are some key projects you focused on? Yeah, so um, the key projects are adding some service lines to our business. So uh, at the moment, we've probably sort of got the consulting, wealth management um, and finance side of things and, and looking to expand out into accounting and, and other areas as Andrew sort of even touched on. So we want to sort of become that place where our SME clients can come in and, and be full to service um, to help them both in their business life and their personal life. And from, I mean, I'm, I'm only guessing here, so I don't want to put words in your mouth, but um, you've got you sort of live on this growth phase and, and you like you say you're looking at new streams. Is it does it get tough though to focus on one or the other, even from a technology perspective, because there's so many options coming up? You know, is it hard to know or oh, we should implement that next or or we should focus on this next thing? How do you prioritize that? Really hard. So I think the biggest the, the biggest thing for us was finding a solution with our technology that was um, you know an open architect. So we we can yeah. sort of push and pull data. Yeah, we need to form that base early um, in preparation for this because if we're adding sort of new service streams and, and lines on, we need to actually be able to use the data that we're already collecting um, to efficiently sort of service them in other areas. So. You know, that was a goal of ours that we've done. Um, and then as moving forward, we need to make sure when we're looking at bits of technology that they work within that environment. Yeah, for sure. Andrew, talk to me about Kui and, and your goals um, for the business and how that's related into some specific projects you've worked on. Yeah, so we've got the the team and the infrastructure in place now to be able to handle uh, some quite significant growth in terms of the client numbers. So uh, basically between now and um, the end of next year, we aiming to double the number of clients that we service. Uh, so uh, that's going to come through efficiencies um, uh, there. But so, so we had a lot of resources dedicated to um, going through this um, technology change that we've had in the business because it ended up being quite a substantial project that we did end up taking on. Uh, and we're now able to move them back into uh, more of the business as usual side of things, which um, certainly frees up a lot of capacity and sets us up well for that next stage. Uh, so... Yeah, that's where our focus on is uh, certainly looking after more clients uh, and also just improving uh, the communication and the touch points that we have with our clients. Yeah, making them you know more impactful and probably less effort for you and the clients, right? It needs to feel more sort of smooth and easy. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're all concerned. Yeah, for sure. Nigel, how about you guys? So for Cientium, you know, what are the sort of goals you've put in place and, and you know, has that played out to some immediate projects you've worked on or will be working on? Yeah, well, Scientium is really exciting. Obviously, when you get a startup going, you just try to survive and um, work out if you've ever got something that works and yeah. you want to use. And so it's pretty frightening for a while, very frightening. Um, but then we've, yeah, we've just jagged this, um, our first anchor client, which is super exciting. So, you know, they've got a, a huge client base. Our project is just to focus hard on that and get, get this to work and get on board. Um, which, you know, it's a bit, it's, it's a real year program. They've got over 20,000, um, customers to, to bring onto the to, onto the system and and, and um, really work that through. So that's 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 massive for us, and that'll keep us um, pretty focused, which is really exciting. Um, yeah, the art the art side. Um, look, it's all really been about people and, and processes, and, and um, you know, trying to hire some right people the last couple of months and get a few more people on board. Um, we we've we've been working through this system called EIOS, which is an entrepreneurial operating system. It's it's a um, it's a book. It's a system. It's pretty big in the US. If you ever come across it, it's been fantastic for us. So, implementing those sort of um, the staff, the culture, the systems and processes, um, it's sort of like the the Jim Collins stuff brought down into a bit of a, a shorter focus uh, yeah, system. Okay. So, so that's been really really great great for both sides of the business. But obviously, with two hats on, you know, just juggling the two can be challenging. But um, but you know, getting an anchor client for Centium is our our big focus. Right now, and then the arch business getting the rest of the team to really take on a more, lot more responsibility um, and bring those advisors through, man. Yeah, exciting. So, 
we've sort of taken the time to sort of paint the picture of each of you and, and you know, the practices, um, who you're serving, uh, how you go about it and sort of those the vision you have and the things you're working on. I now want to get to sort of the specific project that, you know, we'll be talking about for the rest of the episodes. And let's start with, you know, what was the trigger? So, you know, sometimes the need to investigate new technology is due to a specific teeth grinding challenge, right? It's like, ah, we can't put up with this any longer. Sometimes it's part of a sort of a regular upgrade process you have in place. So I'd love to know sort of, you know, which of those applies to you and, and what that trigger was. Jamie, let's start with you. What was the trigger for you guys? Uh, for me, it was double entry of data. It provides absolutely no value to clients. Um, and, and when I first joined the industry, like in the amount of like just transferring a name onto you know ten different things is to me just the most inefficient waste of time um, you could possibly have. So that that was the core problem in my mind um, that that started along my journey. Um, I, I I feel like I'm a I'm a lazy worker. If I've got to keep doing the same thing, I just don't want to do it. So yeah. I look for ways to cut corners in that regard and, and create the efficiency. So to me, it was the that was the big moment, um, and I, I couldn't believe how far the industry was behind on some of these things. It's interesting, isn't it? And it's not just the time that you, you like the double entry time, and it's not just the human error that can occur every time you enter again, yeah. right? You misspell or you put in the wrong number, but you can't underrate the frustration for the team at double entry. Like, and and I and I started off in in, in that sort of admin role myself, so you know I've been through those frustrations, and well, and you know and that brings absolutely zero value to the client, but yeah. it brings cost to the business to deliver advice, and yeah. so you know when we looked at those things. Um, that's not what we want to be spending our time doing. Uh, we yeah. want to be with our clients. So um, that was a big moment for me and, and the first time I joined the industry and, and it's been a journey ever since. Awesome. So, Andrew, what about you guys? You you mentioned the sort of different silos you had. What was the trigger for you guys that caused you to go, right, we've got a project on our hands here, let's start, start working? Yeah, absolutely. So similar to Jamie in some respects where um, we had – a lot of double entry of data and uh, where that originated from was having the different business lines and the financial planning CRM uh, that we were using certainly uh, wasn't suitable for non-financial planning parts of the business. Uh, you know, some areas tried to make it work and use it like accounting and finance, but for the property side of the business, it was just it was certainly a no-go. Uh, it just it doesn't work in that respect. So what happened was we had uh, a lot of double entry of data. We had a lot of siloed information as well. So we didn't have a really good picture of clients from end to end. Uh, we also had this situation where clients might update one part of the business on some details uh, around their personal or financial situation, but that didn't mean that it was getting updated across other parts of the business, whereas you know, obviously the clients would expect that we'd be able to keep everything up to date and we'd be one point of contact and uh, make their interactions and their life a lot easier. So we're sort of looking at that and going, well, we've got a problem here. We probably need a CRM that is going to work across the business, uh, which then turned into a bigger project because then you start uh, replacing other uh, parts of your tech stack. When you move away from an advice CRM, you obviously lose all the tools that come with an advice CRM. So you then end up basically replacing everything in the advice tech stack. So um, there's a lot there, yeah. So it wasn't quite the small, well, not that it was ever going to be a small project, but it turned into something much bigger than you expected once you started looking into it. It did, but it, it was essential. So uh, yeah. we've just got to accept that. And uh, we, we've mostly, yeah, we, we've worked through that now and uh, start to see the benefits. And I guess that's important to, to just touch on is is that can happen, can't it, when you embark on one of these in projects and you do it well. So you're doing your fact-finding well, you're really understanding what you need. You suddenly realize this is bigger than I thought it was. I guess, yeah, I'm curious, you know, what went through your head or what caused you not to back off, which which happens for a lot of practices. They sort of go, yeah. whoa, dude, yeah. <laughs> this is too big. I'm just going to put up with what we've got. What was the driving force yeah. for you that caused you to go, no, nah, we're going to keep this up. We're going to go through. Yeah. So one of the um, the solutions that we um, decided to proceed with, they were pretty good up front in that they, uh, they alerted us to um, – the tech adoption, um, I think it's called the tech adoption life cycle, where basically you identify a problem, you get the peak of inflated expectations, then you start to implement it and you go down into the, the trough of disillusionment where you start looking at going, what are we doing? This is a complete waste of time. 
And then you start to come out the other side and you, you get that realization and the benefit and you go, wow, it's actually working. So it'd be like how, you know, as advisors, we have to manage clients and their psychology through market cycles. A similar thing happens with tech adoption. Yeah. Yeah. And and the, the bigger the tech, the bigger the, the cycle. Oh, the curve. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, I've heard it referred to as the pits of despair. In fact, <laughs> after that initial, yeah, I think that's a fair comment. <laughs> absolutely, yeah, particularly as it, if it becomes as big as as yours did, um, Nigel. I'm curious for you what the um, you know the trigger really for you embarking on this journey. You know, was it a, a specific teeth grinding challenge, or was there something else that caused you to go? You know, what we need to do something that that fixes this sort of broader problem for the market. Yeah, well, well, we we went out there and thought, well, mate, there's got to be someone who's done this when we was were trying to find the solution for those younger or non-ideal type clients, I suppose. And and there really wasn't like there's a pure robo, which to us was just product online. Yep. Um, there was no real education mix between it. Like there's education there, but there's no real link. And like it's we, quite passive, isn't it? So the education there is quite passive in that sense. Yeah, we truly see the value of advice. So we didn't. Yeah. Well, we were trying to be technology versus advisor, saying you, you can only go online. We're trying to bring that together and say, right, you can do a lot online to get along the journey, but for a lot of people, that journey they still need advice. So how do we create that link? And but some people can live online for a bit longer. Some people might on, only always live online and happy to interact online. But there are some people who do need advice. And so how do we bridge that gap uh, and make it around that journey rather than around the product? Whereas what what we found was everyone was just going buying our product it performs well or spaceship or whatever but you know and that's not there's no education there what happens is people they do heaps of advertising and they blow a lot of money and people you know suddenly the market goes down they get out like that's not a great outcome with what i want to be long term successful with their money and, and their investments and how to learn that in that process and and connect to the the, the great advisors out there and you know, allow advisors to you know help, help more people through that journey we're not saying to advisors only focus on that they they, they obviously where they need to focus on their profit and their businesses, the clients that pay them better fees or however their business works. Yeah. But to be able to think about a solution to to bring people through um, and add some value in there. So, Courtney, for you, though, it I get the sense that this was less a, um, a specific challenge as much as just a reg- regular process or, you know, upgrading the way you do things. Is that fair? Yeah, that's spot on, Peter. So we sort of um, laid down the foundational processes and then decided, okay, what's the next iteration of that? And it was very much about how do we become more connected with our members and really just trying to, rather than trying to tell our members, oh, this is how the financial advice industry works, trying to meet them at their expectations. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, for sure. And it is an interesting, it's it's an interesting realisation and journey trying to come of it from their side. It's not easy when the, the legislation and everything else we're surrounded by does the reverse. It really is coming from our perspective and the product perspective. <laughs> but it is part of a journey, isn't it, to really um, put yourselves in their shoes and then go, all right, then, you know, how, how might we change things? To that end then, to sort of put, set us up well for, you know, episode, episode two in the research phase, what type of tech solution were you therefore looking at as part of that project? Yeah, so, I, I mean, our main um, our main goal was to get something that was – really connected, connected to what we were currently doing, but also allows the member to connect with us. So it's something right. that was on their phone at base that they could just plug in and go. Yeah. So client facing sort of, and were you looking for something that you're tracking goals, all that sort of stuff? This was quite like, not just sort exactly. of a sit and forget. It's really interactive. Is that fair? Yeah, exactly. Really interactive. Um, something that we would allow us to keep our members accountable with what they wanted to achieve. So very much centered on goals and how do we keep track of their goals? How do we make sure that they're getting uh, the feedback around their goals? Yes, you're on track. You spent X, Y, Z this month. You know, that's over budget, that's under budget, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So, Andrew, for you then, with in terms of the type of tech solution, what was that one you started with and then what ended up being added to the list as you guys started the project in terms of the types of tech you decided you needed to look at? Yeah, it started with the CRM, which then right. meant that we then had to go and work out, well, how are we going to write statements of advice? How are we going to do the modeling? How are we going to research risk products? How are we going to research super products? Right. How are we going to make it all talk to each other? Uh, so we ended up with yeah needing to sort of cover all those those areas. Uh, so pretty well um, a complete replacement of the um, okay. advice delivery tech stack. So blank whiteboard, start again almost. If we're starting from scratch. What would we do? 
Yeah, okay. Type of roach, yeah. Exciting and terrifying. All at the same time on the other end. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Um, how about you, Jamie? So in terms of the um, you know, the system then, you were similar, right? You were looking for sort of CRM, something that sort of um, could be the center of your tech stack. Is that fair? Yeah, the integration piece we actually looked at. So yeah, what okay. could, what, 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 if we were to use different bits of technology, what could help them talk? Um, be that would actually, yeah, that, what would be the glue? So that's actually where we started and it evolved from there into the sort of CRM and, and data hub piece and, and sort of, you know, the add-ons from there. But we actually look for that integration piece first. Which is interesting. So that, so the glue, and I guess that's part of you, uh, in terms of your goals and where you were going was you knew there was going to be more things you were going to want in the future. So making sure you had something that could connect to a whole, of, a whole lot of that was clearly important. And, and making sure I had that statement before, if we got down a journey with integrating with something and then we didn't want to use it anymore and found something else, um, I didn't want the process of blowing it up and starting again. I, right. I wanted to be able to sort of move that data as efficiently as possible yeah. um, and start using that new bits of technology. Yeah, perfect. So Nigel, for you guys then, you know, behind or underneath, Scientium is some tech. So what was the particular tech solution you went out to hunt for um, that you ended up having to, to go to mark, market and then do that research on? Yeah. I mean, the education piece was a big big part of it and how we make that really engaging and, um, and, and something that people want to come back to, that sort of connecting that onboarding piece and to uh, if they do want to invest direct. So we, are, we have got the functionality to invest direct as well for those who do want to be self-do-it-yourself. Do yeah. So trying to bring all that together has obviously been pretty complicated from, you know, I hear the pain of the others in the full advice practice. I mean, I'm yet to find that they're vulnerable, that data coming together. I mean, like having CRMs and different systems, I still can't, I uh, haven't seen how someone who could do that all in one piece. Um, but, you know, I think it certainly has moved a long way forward in the last couple of years. Uh, yeah. There's still, there's still some gaps. So, yeah, it's, 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 it's not, I'm not saying we've, uh, we've solved it all, but I think everyone's seeing that this technology is making it better and there's, there's some stuff out there we don't know about. And the more you sort of scratch the service, there's all sorts of things going on that hopefully um, hopefully end up in better solutions for our clients. And I guess for you guys then, though, you know, the tech you ended up having to hunt for was not something you would have either even asked for or, or knew to look for before, something like a learning management system. I mean, there's not yeah. many advisors that would even know what an LMS is. Okay. Yeah, that's why that, uh, we did. Uh, you know, we didn't know what we didn't know, and we went yeah. there and found some stuff that I'd never heard of, and all sorts of things, and that can be challenging in itself. But bringing in basically the technology reporting had nothing to do with financial services. We started in financial services, but what we actually used is stuff that was in a totally different industries that were reporting. Yeah. Go, actually, that's what we're looking for, um, and that's um, yeah, that's been a really interesting journey. Yeah, yeah, it is, and and I'm I'm with you there. I love the opportunity to go outside the industry, but it has its own challenges because there's more on the list then. So yeah. research is much broader and harder. So as we sort of, you know, wrap up this phase, the fact fun phase, I am really keen to get from each of you, you know, when you're sort of looking back on the specific project we're going to be talking about um, and the fact find process in particular. So thinking through the facets of your business, is there anything you felt you may not have considered well enough? You know, now that you look back, that maybe, you know, if you were, um, you know, any of the goals or drivers or characteristics that now you go, oh, wow, if we'd thought of that earlier, it might have made things easier or changed the path you went on. Um, Courtney, is there anything there that you think would have changed your answer? Or do you think you guys sort of as part of this structured cycle, you really knew um, what you needed and what the next step was? Yeah, I, I don't think there's anything for us. Um other than sort of noting that I don't think the industry has found a, a really robust solution yet. I think we're still sort of developing different technologies that can help advice businesses deliver what they want to deliver. Yeah, particularly from that client-facing perspective, it's something that's probably uh, younger in terms of tech, um, meaning yeah, it's not definitely. as well developed, there's not as much of it, you know, there hasn't been as much time spent. So, yeah, that's fair. Um, and it to that end, then, was would there be any tips you'd give practices that are sort of, you know, embarking on that first fact-finding phase to really understand, I mean, even, you know, the client's perspective? Is there anything, you know, from that fact-finding phase you guys would recommend as they're embarking on a new tech project? Yeah, definitely. I, th I think the best thing that we did was hold a focus group with our members. Uh, so we just picked 12 of our most opinionated members got them in a room, um, got an external facilitator, and I just sat in the room and, and pretty much wrote down everything that they said, which gave us a really good basis to sort of step away from what we thought that they wanted and get a really good understanding of what they actually wanted. So 
um, yeah, when I look back at the process, that was definitely a really valuable step. And then the other thing is, as you've sort of heard us all talk about it, is planning, you know. Yeah. You need to explore all the avenues before you just dive in because as Andrew's seen, you know, he started with one one option and then it just grew and grew and grew. So make sure you plan. Yeah, for sure. Well, it, it feels like you're next, Andrew. So is there, you know, any... <laughs> Any elements of, you know, characteristics of the business that maybe you you would have looked at more deeply originally, do you know what I mean? So if you could do the fact-finding process again or you could do the scoping process again, is there anything you'd do differently um, before embarking on the next big project? Oh, look, there certainly is, but I mean, everybody has 2020 vision in mm. sight. I think uh, the most important thing for us is we knew we had to make a change, so we got in and, and did it, uh, and certainly there were ways that we you know we could have done things better and approached it in a better way and they're just lessons and we'll, we'll apply that to, to next time you know certainly uh, I, I think the key thing is early on in the process making sure that you've got someone who is responsible for the project in the business rather than trying to have too many people responsible you really need a champion or a leader of the project is the yeah. key thing uh, otherwise you've got too many people uh, sort of running off in their own directions and yeah. things just yes. don't come together yeah. nicely yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> It really Absolutely. is. Yeah, are there any tips you'd give? Um, I mean, there will be a lot of practitioners listening who have, have done what you started or started what you've done yeah. and then hit that wall and gone, this is bigger than I thought. Is there any tips you would give them of how you push through? Like how do you how do you yeah. just move forward such that you can get it done? Because you all know, you know, we all know deep down sometimes these things just need to be done. It's going to be hard and horrible yeah. and and even maybe slow us down for, for months, but it's necessary. Any tips you'd give them? I think you've just got to constantly look and you know, remind yourself of what your goals are and why you're on this journey and why you're making these changes. Uh, yeah. that, that's the thing. I mean, if you lose sight of why you're doing it, then why would you persist? Yeah. Uh, certainly. No different to clients, right? Yeah, that's it. It's not Absolutely. different. Very it simple. really is. And it's why the the goals, you know, all that all that discussion we just had about your goals and where you guys wanted the legacy, all of that's really important to remind ourselves of because that's what causes, you know, then you you suffer. You're willing to suffer through the pain knowing that's where you're heading. Yep. Um, whereas the pain's not worth it if you're not sort of heading anywhere. I'm right there with you. Nigel, is there anything you'd say, you know, you went through, you've gone through quite a, an interesting journey. We're going to sort of, you know, really dig into that in the next few episodes. But from that fact-finding perspective of understanding what you – need and want and, and where you guys were at. Is there anything that you would do differently or that you look back and think, oh, we could have saved ourselves some time or effort if we just dug a bit deeper into that key element? Oh, every part of it, Peter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think Andrew said you can look back in time and I mean, Courtney was spot on. Like it's, it's, you just got to keep focusing on what the clients want out of this because you can, there's a lot of shiny bells out there and um, a lot of ideas, a lot of um, systems and things, but if you keep coming back to, does this help a client? Does this make it simpler? Um, are we helping more clients? Because it's really easy to get caught up with stuff that actually isn't going to add a lot of value to the end client. Um, yeah. uh, and that's that's what we constantly talk about here. Going, does that make a difference? Is that really what clients want? You know, that's that's just that's just got to keep keep us centered and that that real client focus about anything we're trying to do. Yeah, absolutely. But, yeah, there's lots of yeah. And through all this year, you you. you you sign up with certain things that you shouldn't have and you make mistakes along the way. That's so important as part of the journey. There's no way you can probably can't avoid that in the future really. Like is there's stuff that's going to come up that you think, oh, that wasn't quite the right thing we we're looking for. But you've got to be out there and try and give things a go and be curious as well. That's the thing. I'm not sure I question when you're you know, you're mastering a practice like we you know, we're all, we're not talking about being an employee here. This is this is a leadership role. If you aren't, if there aren't hiccups or some, wow, I wish we hadn't done that. Let's reverse it and go in this different direction. If there aren't any of those, I question whether you're pushing hard enough. Mm. Like I sort of believe that's just the flip side of going a bit hard and curiosity and trying out new things. Is you just go, ooh, that didn't work, you know, or that's not the right thing, or hey, we're going to have to choose differently. I just think that's a facet of of curiosity and ingenuity. You know, it's it's all par for the course, really. Jamie, I'm curious about you know any insights from your fact-finding, you know, journey and, and the business, is there anything that you'd look out for next time or dig a dip, bit deeper in terms of your goals or drivers or anything else in terms of a tech project like that? Yeah. So, I, I think everyone sitting on this phone, um, we're, all, we're all professionals and when we talk to our clients, we, we show the value of advice and say use professionals. Um, something mm-hmm. I found along the journey is, is finding a professional that I could lean on to actually give me advice. So, um, I found a trusted source um, that was able to 
you know, I had, I've got a billion ideas, but having a trusted source that could understand what I was trying to talk about and 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 have that conversation with me to say, you know, are you doing this? Is this is, does this make sense for these reasons? You know, is this bringing value to the end client as Nigel was talking about? Um, I sort of started. I only had that sort of through halfway through my journey, but now I've got that resource that I trust and 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 just pitch ideas and, and go through that process and and someone that's willing to, you know, and he's from the tech industry because there's a lot of people you can meet that go, yeah, I can build that, yeah, I can build that, and <laughs> yeah, you know, of course they can build it, but at the end of the day, if you just spend a heap of money, so I think you're actually better off spending the money um, to find a resource that, that can give you that advice and that you trust. Um, yep. Because at the end of the day, if you're using good professionals, as we all are, um, you know we bring we bring value. So it's the same for that industry. Oh, I love it! I think that's a that's a great note to finish on. Look, Nigel, Courtney, Jamie, and Andrew, that was a marathon effort. Well done, folks. We've covered off a lot of you know each of your unique starting points on this journey of you know researching and implementing new technology. Thank you so much for being so transparent, and I'm really confident that there's going to be some event, immense value for the listeners who are considering, you know, any new tech projects in the future. And I look forward to um, them finding more about each of you in the episodes to come. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here. to be here. Thank you. After such great insights from our guests that we were keen to get you even more from the broader advice market. So here with me right now is the CEO of Dash, Andrew Whelan, and we're going to see what we can get in terms of what you see, Andrew, from the marketplace and some of the things that the guests covered, because I think there was some really interesting insights that surprised me a little. Yeah, like, really good. When we laid this out and we were going to divide it up into the different sections of the advice process, I thought, oh, how naff, which I love, right? So <laughs> this is great. Um, but I honestly wasn't sure what we'd get out of the fact find mm-hmm. discussion. You know, mm-hmm. I thought, oh, yeah, well, it's it's speaking, isn't it? It's, it's creating a specification for what you need. Mm. But there were some really interesting insights. One of them that I wanted to dive into was a number of the practices needed to use or use or wanted to use virtual resources. Now, that might be overseas. It might be local outsourcing to power planners and that they sort of did factor that into their tech consideration. Is that something you see and you think is important when people are really building out that specification? Yeah, it's an important it's an important consideration because what it can be is like is a lagging indicator in a lot of ways because they're a workforce. And I know right. that speaking from an ex-power planning shop, Power planning shops want to be efficient. They want to use the most common tech, right? Yeah. So incumbency rules in power planning typically outsource power planning because they want to use the tools that most people use and then be the most efficient. Um, and if you're running it, if you're running a power planning business, having four or five different uh, tech implementations is tricky from a training and upkeep right. perspective, right? Imagine it in your business being a nightmare. Yeah. Um, so one thing that you have to be really clear on if you want to make a shift is how flexible your outsource providers are yeah Uh, and uh, some have owned their own which makes things easier but others are genuinely outsourced to other businesses offshore Uh, and then you've got to have it not only not only do you have to consider that from a workflow and a quality perspective you've also got to consider that from a tech stack perspective so do you then own the models afterwards are you getting word documents back you know, is that how you want to present SOAs? How do you, how does that work with the SOA presentation layer as well as the generation layer? That's a really interesting point, isn't it? Because there's two things here. One, hey, make sure you ask the questions of whoever you currently use or are going to be using, so that you can factor that into mm-hmm. you know who you know you're researching to tech. But also, um, don't do it after the fact. Like this is yeah. clearly. <laughs> Like once yeah. you've made the decision you've implemented, it could mean you hit a wall that means you don't get the efficiencies you're otherwise hoping to get. Yeah. Or you don't get, um, you have compliance problems right. because you don't own the files or you've got them. So right. it's a really, uh, you know, shifting this stuff around is a really consultative, collaborative thing. And yeah. You, and um, I think the guys have been clear later on that mapping out the processes ahead of time is critical, like being very clear on the problem. Yeah. Um, there's no... There's no substitute for that. No. And look, that brings me to sort of my next one, which I thought was interesting. So Fox and Hera are relative, relatively young mm. financial advice practice. And yet, you know, Courtney's undergone a, a complete review and almost restructure of their processes recently, mm. which I mean, fantastic. You know, I'm cheering quietly as we're having that discussion. 
But I was curious, is that something you see most practices doing, like a really proactive on a cycle review of their processes? Or do you find it almost as triggered by a tech? Rec- like what's the thing? What's the chicken or the egg mm. here in that oh, sort of What I see situation? in big businesses is they have routine. Right. Um, they have routine where they go out and scan the market. Um, which can be frustrating for us because yeah. you know it's part of the, yep. you know, there's not necessarily a deal on the table that they're yep. scanning. But typically in finance, the most typical is, um, and I think what we saw in Fox and Hare's case is they've grown really quickly. Like yes. Really, this is a successful business. Yeah. And then they're getting m- more clear on who their demo is and what their needs are. Yeah. So I think after six years, my – my impression from what I've heard is, well, we're quite a big business now and now we're clear. So, how are we going to kick on from here? So, you do yeah. see that regularly in a cycle. And I think similarly for Andrew and Jamie's business as well is that they sort of hit a point where, you know, their their needs are no longer met because of size and scale and yeah. clarity of purpose reasons. Yeah. Taking that further though, do you think, so when your team go in and we're diving ahead here, so some of the stages, but- when your team go in, is one of the biggest walls they'll hit is when somebody isn't clear on their processes. Like they really sort of have got a, a very high level view. They've not bothered to go a bit granular and therefore it's hard to build out or or truly implement for them. It, it's not on the um, – it's interesting. From a sales perspective, it's actually slower when you're working through people through the processes. Right. So the temptation on the tech side is mm-hmm. to, oh, you want this – you want a better mousetrap? Cool, here's ours, Woo-hoo, right? Yeah. <laughs> but um, what we, because our, our offering is very different, so we, 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 we're not trying to sell all people in all rooms on all Dash modules. Right. We're trying to sell people on an integrated experience, yeah. you know, so that they can eliminate rekeying, which came up on, yeah. you know, all the time as a real pain point. So yeah. that really spoke to me. But um, what we find is in terms of the more successful implementations, so when we get to later on in the mm. process, um, the more successful ones are the ones that are more deliberate from a process perspective yeah. because they haven't, you know, snookered themselves or there's no unintended consequences from what they've rolled out. And I think yep. Andrew spoke about some other things where he's been impressed, you know, on the yeah. on the flip side, but then on in the first meeting, but then when he rolled it out to a team of almost 30, so, he was like, oh, I've actually done the wrong thing here. And yeah. the ability to s- use Dash to switch things in and out was right. critical and he was able to do that and turn it around. So um, the ability to fail fast and fix it quick, yep. I think, is is really important. But yep. yeah, the, ideally, you've kind of thought about everything ahead of time. Because I think also, and, and I would be really curious on your view on this, and I know that you're much like myself, that when you get asked a question, you answer it, right? So I'm putting you yep. on the spot here. But okay. yeah. I wonder whether advisors get in their own way here because we view processes from our perspective. Yeah. And often haven't even enunciated a process from the whole business's perspective. And so we don't even necessarily see the blockages. We don't even necessarily mm. see where the problems are. And so often if they haven't actually enunciated, like really laid out the processes and fully understand them, they don't even really understand the pain points well. Is that fair? It, it's kind of fair. I think they um, – we, we've actually even invented a framework that we've talked about this called – that we call it the Innovation Implementation Framework. Nice right? name. Nice yeah. thing. <laughs> IIF, uh, patent bending. Um, but basically, it, it, it's just a short version of saying look at the downstream impacts first. So one of the f- classic things that advisors do because they're people people and they really want to grow and mm-hmm. they're business owners first and foremost. Mm-hmm. So – they want to make the front of house slick, yeah. You know? And so I want to make a good impression. I want to add value immediately, and I want to go fast, fast, fast. Mm. But if your conversion rate goes up thirty percent because you've got better tech, and you haven't invested in any of the back office, yeah. which is less sexy but critical to yeah. the overall client experience, then all you're doing is putting pressure on an existing team yeah. who are not going to be bought in. So everybody needs to go on the journey from the beginning yeah. uh, for us, the most successful one. And often if you want to add capacity to the front end, like you want to add conversion um, results, add co- conversion capacity, then you've got to build capacity at the back end first and do that on sexy work first right. and then move forward because yeah. that bit at the front end is often the simplest. 
And I would argue probably the quickest to react. Like you'll really see results instantly. Whereas, yeah. where, and therefore you're going to hit that wall in the back office. That's right. It's just going to happen yeah. so fast. So fast. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Now you mentioned rekeying, and I feel like we can't move forward without talking about that. You must have some insights into how bad that is in yeah. the industry. Like what? How how often are people doing that within the different systems? Uh, three to four is the average in any practice. Like any practice, you walk around, they're rekeying it, and so that's across. And it, and it creeps up on you because it's, it's like death by a thousand cuts. It's over 10 years this happens where right. you, your templates fall out of coding or this hasn't been updated or you've introduced an online fact find that doesn't integrate with your CRM and your CRM doesn't really talk to that you've got a different risk researcher and there's so many pieces of kit yeah. now and three to four platforms, you know, three platforms as well. So rekeying is a massive burden that I think, as Jamie said, adds value to no one. Yes. <laughs> so it's just... <laughs> Busy work that yep. um, you, the world can do without. A hundred percent. So that's our whole reason for for being. It's and and so demoralising, right? It's one of those tasks because you just, know it. You oh. know you know what's happening when. Yeah, you do it. as you do it. Oh, it's awful. All right, I'm excited to get your insights in our next episode for research. I'll look forward to seeing you then. Great, thanks.